pressing the record button and it says ask the host. So is that Donna or? Uh, yeah, I, I, I did it. I've, I've hit the button. We are now oh, okay, recording. Great. This is great. Book Thanks. Club from July 11th, Chapter eight, 7 and 8 of Ron Glossop's World Federation book. Excellent. Thank Thanks so much. Record. Great. Thank you. And, and just on that note, if anyone wants to say anything that they feel is, is too personal, they don't want to record it, too sensitive or what have you, that's absolutely fine. Let us know. We'll pause the recording and then put it back on when you're done. So no problems there. Okay, so, um, so going back to Lee's, um, Lee's question, all these proposals for addressing UN voting schemes are interesting and worthy of debate, but how do we get the General Assembly and Security Council nations to consider a form of the current voting system? Does anyone think that a UN 2020 or your UN 75 actions will actually push the nations of the world to consider voting change? So that was the first question. And by the way, I should have said these questions are attached to the latest email that Gail sent out, if you're wondering where I'm getting them from. So the second voting question was submitted by Donna. And she asks, in chapter eight, Ron says that one of the most important things to figure out is how voting will work in a world federation since this determines who has the power. In chapters seven and eight, Ron is supportive of the binding triad as a way to define how votes would be counted. I'm interested in better understanding how the binding triad compares to Joe Schwartzberg's weighted voting suggestion and, and which approach seems to be more desirable. So those are the two voting questions. Uh, before I throw the floor open to build a queue, um, just to also remind people, that attached to um, that same email was a document where David Orton prepared an overview of the and comparison of the different voting schemes that have been proposed for World Federation. Uh, in addition to that, there's also a resending out, which we've sent out before, of David Orton's summary of Ron's entire book. So with that, I will um, take a cue who would like to either ask a question about those things or have a comment or take a stab at an answer. Don't all raise your hands at once. <laughs> Going on. Okay, uh, I see Melanie first. Okay, anyone after Melanie? Okay, and then Arthur. I'll take a third person and then we'll get started if there is a third. Okay, we'll see if anybody else jumps in the queue after Melanie and Arthur. And like I said, as always, uh, we'll let Ron, um, you know, have the last word in each area. Um, and I do hear something like a grinding in the background or something. So if you're off mute and you're grinding, uh, please go back on mute. Thank you. Let's start with Melanie. Um, so, oh, but yeah. I yeah. I yes, Gail. I'm sorry, um, Gail. Yeah, so each person has two minutes, is it? Or three? Correct. Each person has two, two minutes. Two minutes. And okay. If, and uh, if, if you let you. people know when, when we've reached the two. Okay. And then I'll time the 15 minutes overall. Okay. So that, that grinding is quite prominent in the background. So if you I wonder if it's me. Let's see if, let's see if it's me. I'll put okay. Oh, it is. Sorry about that. So I'll, go, I'll see if okay. I can. Go ahead, Arthur, and I'll okay. see if I can figure out what okay. that is. Okay, let's start with Arthur, go ahead. So you have to go off mute, Arthur. Okay, yeah, also if you uh, need to anytime, mute all and then everybody can unmute when they wanna unmute. Um, Terrific, thank you. My big concern uh, about all this weighted voting is that uh, in general, it, the reason why so many of the countries are poor is they've had all their resources extracted by the rich countries through colonialism and then post-colonialism. And to give more power to the colonial powers who are the ones destroying the world. They're the ones with the nuclear weapons. They're the ones threatening the destruction. The rest of the countries have voted to abolish nuclear weapons, to take decent steps to improve our planet. Uh, so it's a complex question of how do you do it, but I have a, a lot of concerns about weighing in favor of the people with money. We, they're already way too overweighted uh, in their power over the effects of the UN. And so I think we need something more interactive. And I also think we need to move 
beyond voting to interact, you know, interactive conversational systems that bring out highest and best wisdom, like like Gary was talking about. I mean, you see this you see? discussions we have. If you just started off with a vote, who's right and who's wrong, we wouldn't have come up with nearly as good decisions as when we have an interactive collaborative process. And I think a greater focus on interactive collaborative processes that can actually help build world consensus rather than divisions by the old fashioned voting methods is so crucial. I mean, uh, one of the things Gary said is, you know, the old town hall was great. People had interactive things, but then we had representatives, which meant we had to just vote and send somebody off by horse and buggy to a different city. Uh, but now we can all participate in the same room. We're doing it right now. We're beginning to do it around the world with Zoom. And we need a more interactive, more advanced uh, way of making decisions for the planet than going backwards. Okay. Thank you, Arthur. How are we on grinding, Melanie? Checking. Is that better? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, we Sorry got you. That. Yeah, well, that was very well said, Arthur. And um, I'd just like to add, yes, about the equation, having, having that part of the, see, I still hear something. Yeah, but just speak clearly and, and we, we can hear you. Okay. So basically well, having well, you money. Can call back in if you want. And uh, Arthur, can, can you read your phone, please? Thank you. Please continue, Melanie. Um, just real quick about the money part of the equation using um, who, who contributes most to the UN as part of the equation. I really question that. It seems to be more like buying the vote is my little input after Arthur. I thought that was great, Arthur. Okay, I'll put myself on mute. Great. Thank you. Um, and, and I, I want to apologize for anyone who feels they've cut them off, that the moment all people with goodwill start coming in with their suggestions, it gets very difficult to manage, and we start talking over each other. So please allow me to do the problem solving, and if I can't do it, I'll turn it over to somebody to do it, rather than everybody jumping in. Uh, it's just really difficult to manage. Um, okay, so I'm taking the next cue. I see Donna and Gail, and then I'll put myself in. Go ahead, Donna. First, I want to ask whoever just called in as iPad to please identify mm. themselves. Um, <coughs> we oh, Hello? I'm sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, it's, it's Jim Dimitrio. I don't know why my name keeps getting blocked from that. Jim okay, Dimitrio. Okay, great, Jim. On the beach. Sorry. Great. That's okay. Just wanted to make sure it was somebody we knew. <laughs> a friend, not a foe. Um, Sorry to be in the street. <laughs> because of, that's okay. Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to address this, the issue of, of the money thing. Um, I know I, I read, I read in Joe's book, um, the important, like if, if we want to get changes through the UN and through the Security Council, we sort of need to address the fact about the about the the money and about the countries who are paying more towards the UN budget, feeling like they somehow they are paying to have a larger voice. Um, I, the the one thing that I like about it is that it would perhaps force the U.S. to finally pay its dues, because if we didn't pay our dues, then we wouldn't have our vote. So there's I see that as a positive side, but. I, I do know that it's it, it is one of those tricky things. I, I read I remember somewhere in Ron's book there was a model that said perhaps you could phase it out over time that it would enable kind of the wealthier countries to feel more comfortable to accept it knowing and then um and then it would phase out. I I also remember Joe Schwartzberg saying that the poorer countries would rather have it be clear that the wealthier countries have a larger vote rather than pretend that they don't because right now they do because people are afraid to go against the wealthier countries because they need the help and at least this makes it clear and obvious so i don't know so I, there are lots of different angles about that question thank you great melanie i see your hand i'll get you in the next lineup uh gail you're next then myself i'm responding to what arthur said i agree with you arthur that um you know a big issue <laughs> It has not been much discussed is um, the fact that the uh, powerful countries have continued to uh, attack and try to control 
the global south countries. So, and that's a new form of colonialism called neo-colonialism. And it's done indirectly instead of directly as it, it, it had been direct rule under colonial power. And now it's indirect through unfair trade agreements and in that kind of thing. And in Ron's book, he said a couple different times that um, the global, the poor countries are worried that, um, you know, this would, the, the reforms would lock in the existing power structure. I think it goes beyond that. They're worried that it'll be used as a tool to actually attack them further. Any tool, um, and that includes uh, organizational tools, can be used either for good or for ill. And so that gets in, into underlying problems of um, power differences that are very difficult to address because if we have the most wonderful <laughs> It's still. Um, Please mute your phone if you're not speaking. I'm sorry, Gail. Can you say that last sentence again? Oh, um, even if we have what seems to be the best, most fair structure in the world, it can be taken over by the powerful if there's a big difference in power relations, and that's going to be really difficult to, to address. Thank you. Okay, a call on myself. Um, I, I, I want to say I, I'm totally in alignment with the spirit of author's comment, and, and there are a few kind of sticky wickets that, that I want to point out, and I'm not sure how to get around them, but I, I, I do want to point them out. First, um, when authors are saying was, was having, you know, these global conversations, I, I completely agree, and was wondering, okay, but when the conversation comes to a close, what's the decision-making process? And then author did say consensus. Okay, so, um, so let me speak to that. that. That folks who have studied consensus say that, uh, that, that at about 150 people or so, the process totally breaks down. Uh, that there's almost always someone blocking consensus. It become, I, I live in a consensus-based community with about 75 adults and 25 kids. And, um, and it's not easy, <laughs> even at that number. So there, there are critiques about how large consensus can go. Luckily, there have been some experiments and the, probably the most well-known ones are called sociocracy and holacracy, which is looking at having different layers of interlocking consensus groups and ways to try to break past that 150 barrier. So I just wanna say that's uncharted territory and we need to see how effective we can do consensus on a wide scale. That, that's the first one. Second thing is I, I want to um, re, re, repeat a, a, a critique that Bill Pace, that I once heard Bill Pace say, which is that, you know, we all criticize the Security Council, you know, for its, it, the, you know, being able to veto anything, any, I'm sorry, that it has to be unanimous um, or any one country can veto. Um, and we are saying that, no, no, it should be more democratized. There should be more voting. Uh, but Bill pointed out that if it was, what would have happened is the Security Council would have broken up long ago. That the only reason the powerful countries stayed in is they had a veto. That, 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 and, he, and he attributes that to the reason we have not had a World War III. That if it was a voting thing, and you could overrule Russia or overrule the US or whatever, then what would have happened over the last 75 years is those countries would have left and the world would be less safe. Now, I'm not saying that that's true or false. I'm not taking a position on that, but I wanna relay that position because I think it's one worth considering. So um, that's my uh, comment. I'll take the next cue. Melanie was in first. If Do I, I hold up my hands? fingers like this, it means you're at two minutes, so. You should wrap up. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I wave more. Make sure you get my attention. So, um, and we have five minutes for this whole conversation. I see Melanie first. Anyone else? Um, yeah. Th this means raise your hand. This means you're out of time. <laughs> okay. I see okay. Carla next. Anybody else? Okay. Let's take it away, Melanie. Well, my thought is regarding budget and paying for the. UN, what about every nation has a budget and just one line of the budget is, of course, the United Nations and a percentage of the amount of money 
uh, you know, it's a sliding scale. So it's a sliding scale for each country. So of course, America, you know, if you have more money, if you're rich, well, that's great. But also you're going to pay a uh, higher, you know, the percentage is higher. The more you're going to pay more money because, you know, everyone has the same percent. But I thought that would be a good way to fund the United Nations. Thank you, Melanie. Call it. And call you. Oh, yeah, I, I assume you're going off mute. Yeah. I don't think she heard you, Bob. Are you saying me? Yes. Oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't get my name clear. Um, I'm sorry. What, what I'd like to add to the conversation is something underneath what's been discussed. I think, you know, I would just recommend that we as a group take a look at what is already afoot in, in a basic attitudinal change that would underlie a lot of these issues. And that, that has drawn my attention to Karen Armstrong's Charter for Compassion. It is a four paragraph document, and I just encourage you to go online and check it out. It doesn't even fill a page. It's four paragraphs. And if this were a basic working document, none of the, none of the contrast stuff that you've been discussing could be done. It would have to, they'd pull their feet to the fire, they'd have to look at that charter and say, uh-oh, it doesn't fit. So I, I think we need to, as, as we look at the how-to, and that's Ron's emphasis, the how-to is to notice that this this paltry document that was created by Karen Armstrong and six other religious faith leaders because she sent out uh, an, an innocent email that said, why are the religions of the world such a cause of violence? And she got response. So she gathered these six leaders and they wrote these four paragraphs. She took them to the TED Talks, and she won the TED Prize in 2008. Now that's a paltry $100,000. She took the Charter for Compassion to the Melbourne Parliament of World Religions and opened it up to 8,000 people and declared that she was going to, she was going to use that money to travel city after city and get them to sign on. Folks, she's already got 450 cities in various countries under her belt. Thank you, Carla. And with that, I think we are, um, well, we have a minute left if anyone wants to get a last word and then I'll turn to Ron to wrap up this one. Anybody else have a question or comment? Okay, before I, I ask Ron to jump in, I just want to point out, I, I just was reminded uh, that some people are typing in the chat box. You're welcome to do that. If you don't even know about the chat box, you can go to the bottom of the screen. You'll see the word chat, click on that, and a chat box will, will come out, and there's a parallel conversation going on. I want to say we're not monitoring the chat, so uh, it, it would not be... It, you. Yeah, so don't try to communicate with either me or Gail uh, through the chat. We're, we're not looking at that. We don't have someone monitoring it. But you're welcome to comment on each other, uh, you know, or, or communicate in whatever way you want. Thank you so much. Okay, Ron, anything you want to say about this whole voting issue? Well, I just want to thank everyone for the very good conversation. I think there have been wonderful comments about what needs to be done, what problems still exist. Many of them are just problems that any democracy faces. <laughs> that you've got differences of opinion, you have differences of wealth to express your opinions. And so these are problems that any kind of democracy has to deal with. The one issue that Arthur brought up that I really like is the need for discussions in a democracy before you vote. You gotta let people give their different viewpoints. You got to hear different viewpoints. But that also ties in with my other interests that many of you are aware of, 
that the world needs a common language and it shouldn't be English and it shouldn't be Spanish and it shouldn't be Chinese. It shouldn't be any national language. It should be Esperanto, a language that was invented and developed to facilitate international communication by having a language that's extremely easy to learn and where the oral language and the uh, written language are totally harmonious. That's not the case with most languages. Okay, thank you, Ron. Okay, we'll move on to the next question that was submitted in advance, also from Donna. And that question is as follows. I'm also interested in discussing the pros and cons of using Article 22 to create a UNPA, or United Nations Parliamentary Assembly, for those who are not familiar with the initials. I have heard Soveda, another one of our board members, uh, say that creating a subsidiary organ, the UNPA, for an already subsidiary organ, the General Assembly, is a waste of time. And I understand that argument if there is another way forward, but I don't see another way forward. And I must say, I am drawn to the idea of having a body that represents the people of the world. Then once it exists, they can work to, re to re redefine their role. Okay? And let me say, the, um, subs what, what, what that qu when that question uses the word subsidiary body, I, I think the, um, the issue is advisory body, uh, that people are clear that that's what we meant, that, that the General Assembly is an advisory body, and why have an advisory body to an advisory body? Uh, what, what's the purpose of that? So, uh, and I see Saveda is on the call, so I'll let her get into the queue as well. And Donna was the Queen. questioner, so I'll start with her. Um, I took the word subsidiary from Ron's book. Article 22 said that that the General Assembly can create a subsidiary body. That's where I, I got that word from. Thank you. Also, um, yes, I was going to just raise my hand to hope Soveda would be willing to, to address this. And also to let people know, I put in the chat box that um, the uh, Charter of Compassion, Charter for Compassion that Carla May was talking about was posted as a blog on our website back in January of 2019 with a link for people to endorse it. So I put the link to that blog and the Charter of Compassion in the chat box for anyone interested. Thank you. And so Veda, okay. I hope you're willing to. Okay, well, I'll take to, the cue uh, now and I will let Saveda in first if she wants to be because we're speaking about her idea. So we got Saveda in the queue. Anyone else want to get in on this issue? Going once, going twice. Okay, we could start with Saveda. Go ahead. Um, hi, everyone. <clears throat> So, you know, this question of the UNPA is, has become a pretty confusing one. I've spoken to some folks at the UN uh, who are involved with the UN 2020 um, effort, asking them what they thought UNPA was all about. And it was fascinating because you get different responses depending on whom you're talking to. So. At one end, I, the answer I got was, oh, the UNPA is a way of getting civil societies uh, to participate and have their voices heard uh, as an advisory body to the UN General Assembly, which is already an advisory body. The second answer I heard, which was different, was that the UNPA was a way of getting parliamentarians um, to, uh, it, to to come in and, and be part of this body that advises the UN. Um, I, frankly, I don't think either of, look, we're part of civil society, but we're a self-selected group of people. If we're really talking about um, represented, then we should open up and have direct elections and have the people of the world go ahead, elect their representatives, and then give those, and in other words, transform the UNGA, the General Assembly, and make it a body that truly represents the people of the world through direct election, and then give them authority. Give them authority to pass 
binding rules in a very start with a very, very narrow area. This is what I've advocated all along in my book starting in 2008, all the way to the last one in 2018. Yes, we need to have representation. Yes, we need to have dialogue. Yes, but we need to have the people's voices heard. You know, if, if you live in a country where there are no NGOs or you have 80% of the population thinks one thing, but they happen not to belong to an NGO, it seems very unfair to have the 10% of people who are represented by NGOs have a voice on the world stage. Who appointed them to any position? I, I feel really strongly about this. And then, of course, the second point is the advisory body to the advisory body. The reason why the General Assembly doesn't work is it doesn't have any authority to do anything other than it's a wonderful forum for consultation, but they can't make any decisions that are binding. Now we're talking about layering another advisory body to an advisory body. We're still stuck with the same fundamental problem that you could add five layers, one representing civil society, one representing parliamentarians, one, but if you don't give them authority to make decisions, you're just layering on the bureaucracy and we're feeding into the arguments of people who say the UN is just a bureaucratic institution and oh look, now you just wanna add yet another layer of bureaucracy without any ultimate effect. So this, this, this is why I, I, I think it's confusing. Different people when they say UNPA mean completely different things. If I understood the conversation we had- So Veda, you, our... you might not be seeing the time signal. I don't know oh, if you're I'm looking not. at Oh, I'm not, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I am looking, but for some reason, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, it, I, I, I've said enough. I've thrown out some ideas. Thank you. <laughs> Let me... Thank you, so Veda. Get the okay. gallery view on here again. Okay, anyone else want to get into the queue? Okay, I'll put myself in. Um, anyone else after me? Okay, so um, I, I want to uh, echo what Saveda said about the confusion about UNPA and share what I think is the source of the confusion. That, that when Andreas, uh, at least when I heard Andreas explain the plan, it was a three-step plan that you would phase in. No problem there. The problem is for in the first number of years, he wouldn't say what steps two and three were. So, and I think the, I never asked him, but I thought, that, I think the reason was he didn't want to scare people away. That step one was having parliamentarians and people who were already elected by the population be the ones who would comprise the UNPA. He thought that would be kind of a low bar, that would be accepted, and then that would be step one. Then step two and three, I don't remember all the details, but they did move toward um, having direct elections, et cetera, et cetera, but he felt that would be a bridge too far. Now that's fine, but I, I, I think, I mean, I, I'll ask him at one point when I talk with him, I think strategically he didn't say that in his presentations and stuff. He just talked about level one and people thought that's all it was. And I found myself in many arguments with people and say, no, 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 that's just the first step. And, and it, it was a route to a world federation, but he didn't, I think he didn't want to say that. I don't want to make, uh, imply what his motives were, but he didn't say that. And, I, and I, my guess is that was strategic. He thought that would scare people, but I could be wrong. Could have just been an omission. Uh, but anyway, it was a clear three-step phase. And then when he started coming out with those things and kind of being more bold about, you know, world parliament and all that stuff, he began talking about those later phases. So that's my, my guess at what, what has caused so much of that confusion. Thank you. Anyone else want to get in the queue on that one? Going once. Going twice. Okay, I'll turn to up. Oh, okay, Gail. Um, I just wondered what number, what step three was. Oh, like I said, I don't remember clearly what the next two steps were and what the order was. Oh, but okay. it was, it was. I, I do remember it was moving toward greater democratization and ultimately <clears throat> an election by the people. Okay. And uh, yeah, but he has that all in writing. I mean, you could go to his website. Thank you. Um, okay, so let me turn to Ron once again, if there's anything you want to say on the issue of the UNPA. 
Well, thank you all for a very, very good discussion about some very important points. I just want to observe that what we're talking about here is an issue that has existed for democracy from its very beginning, that is direct de democracy versus representative democracy. Does it make sense to have everybody vote or should people elect representatives who then become better informed about the issues and then vote? And the, the thing that is being put forth uh, has to do with what happened with the European Union. It started out with only representatives that were already legislators in the national boundaries, in the national governments. And then it became elected popularly. And so he's suggesting that the world development should follow what was going on and has happened in the European Union. You still have the problem especially when you're talking about a global government, seven and a half billion people, how are you going to vote? I mean, it gets to be a matter of the practicality of having a direct democracy when you've got so many people. Now, that doesn't mean it can't be done, but it does mean that it is a problem that requires special attention. One of the difficulties with any kind of direct democracy including town meetings, is the possibility that some one or two individuals have the influential, have the capability of influencing people and getting a mass vote that is regret, regrettable later on. <laughs> when you have a momentary feeling that, oh, this is the way to go, but then you wonder, oh, come on, it's too easy for mob psychology to take over and individuals voting for something that they haven't really thought very much about. So the idea of representative democracy is ideally, you are supposed to have people who are better informed. The problem, of course, is that they are not disinterested. <laughs> they, they have their own interests and the people who support them. So it's very difficult for democracy to operate. It's just much better than any alternative. <laughs> you can see what happens when you get a dictatorship and then it becomes difficult to change things. Once a dictator is in charge, that dictator can control things and maintain their control. One of the great advantages of democracy is the possibility of gradual change. Okay, thank you, Ron. So since we didn't fill the full time and the discussion on this topic, I, I will let both Arthur and Soveda into the queue as I see their hands are up. So Arthur, take it away. Um, yes, well, I think that's very well stated and that actually there is a huge danger of just direct democracy, one, one person, one vote, that you could have mob rule, that you could have controlled countries like, the, so, like, the, like China have massive outvoting, not based on really people's real interests, and, 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 and dictators sway people, as we see uh, in the U.S. And uh, I think the key thing is the collaborative process has, and that's what it has to start at the local interactive level. You mentioned that in your small community there, uh, you're able to come to this kind of consensus and help hopefully even synergy, which is a step beyond consensus where you actually come up with something better than you all went into the meeting with. You don't have a, just an agreement on one thing or another. You invent new things that come out of it. And what, what we and Gary were talking about is how do you develop a synergistic system where small groups of people like what you are in interactively uh, have that uh, have that deliberative, not only just a deliberative function, but one with lots of these new tools like, uh, well, there's not only the Charter for Compassion, there's all kinds of new breakthrough technologies and how to do group interaction to get past, uh, to, to reach common goals and come together uh, in, in, in more advanced ways. And that with these interactive tools, we can begin to build uh, a real collaborative, a real uh, a discussion that is it has more weight when it's cross-cultural. Like if, if people on opposite sides of a war come to a synergistic conclusion, that 
that should have, and the algorithm that compiles the interactive uh, uh, will of the people of the planet, <coughs> give more weight to those that come out of the more the deliberative process is cross cultural and cross boundaries and comes to consensus in these small groups, the more weight that has in building a collaborative consensus for the planet of what is the will of the people. Every constitution says it's based on the will of the people. We need a way to really measure it. And the will of the people isn't just their first raw vote. That's, that's, that hasn't had a process that comes to this synergistic, uh, 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 it, more than a consensus, a synergy beyond consensus. So uh, I think, Bob, you're in a great place to, 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 to recognize that in your small community and think about how does that interact at a bigger and bigger uh, sphere. Uh, so anyway, just to begin to beginning to think of new ways. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Soveda. Um, so I have absolutely no trouble with representative democracy, but that's not what we're talking about. So and we need and we're and I think there's a lot of confusion over a lot of different things that are being proposed. And this is what worries me is that people hear one thing and they run with it thinking it's A when it's actually B. So first point, civil society is neither representative democracy nor direct democracy. We decide to form groups to advocate for or to, to, to pursue certain causes. We're a group of self-selected individuals who do this. We haven't taken the temperature of the people around us. We haven't pulled people in our neighborhood, let alone our cities, our counties, our regions, and our countries. So that's A. So, so civil society suddenly leaping to be part, of, be members of an, a UNPA, which is what some of the UN organizers think the UNPA is about. This is why I raise it is not representative democracy. We don't represent anybody other than a very, we only have 400 members for heaven's sakes. So whom do we represent? So that's one. The second thing is even Andres's idea, I totally agree with you, Ron. If we were to follow the pattern that was set by the European Union with the European Parliament, I would be all for it. That's not what Andres is proposing. He's talking about a different group that advises the Council of Europe. If you go back to his website and read in his book and look at what he's actually recommending, these are two distinct bodies, two distinct advisory bodies. He's not talking about the path that the European Parliament took. I think we should follow the path that the European Parliament took. But because, I, I don't know, maybe in the United States, we're not that familiar with all the different bodies in Europe and the different councils. It's very confusing because you've got the Council of Europe and then you've got the European Council and they're actually two different bodies and they do two different things and they have two different, we assume one thing and it's, it's just not correct. So it's really important for us to get our facts straight and really understand what somebody's proposing. So that's another thing that, that has caused a great deal of confusion here. Uh, and, and I'll just stop there, um, just to say that, that, that it's important to start paying attention to details and also considering, yes, absolutely, representative democracy, I'm all for it, but then who are the people who are gonna represent us and how is that representative democracy going to be created? And is just having civil society people rep be represented in the UNPA is that really representative democracy? So those are the questions. Thank you, Soveda. Um, I'll just put myself in the queue before we move on to the next question. One very quick comment as, um, as Arthur was speaking, um, I, I had an idea that I would love to see personally a demonstration project of, of, the, of consensus you know, and or synergy um, at the city level, the state level, the, um, you know, like that, to actually show how this would work. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I, I think it's worth giving it a crack at a large scale to see if and how it can actually work. So I would definitely, you know, if anyone was uh, having a vote on whether we should do a demonstration project at a large scale, I would vote yes. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to the next issue. Um, Tom, I see your hand up. I'll let you in because you haven't said anything yet. So go right ahead. And then I'm going to get on to the next question. I, I just, I, I want people to understand, I've worked with, quote, consensus 
a uh, lot of a long time uh, back back in hippie days. Okay, and and I can't stand the word because it has stopped so many good ideas over the years. So uh, you know, it's just I I, I don't want to hear that word consensus. Sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, Barat, you had your hand up. I can't use a rule for Tom and not allow it for you. So go ahead. You haven't spoken yet. <clears throat> yes. Uh, well, I'm just uh, reflecting on what, Bob, you were saying about seeing a project uh, worked out on a larger scale. I just want to give an example of the way Europe decides on who is the best singer, you know. They have a project where... <laughs> People from all the countries vote on who who the top singer is, uh, performance. And I do know that in some votes in India, there is a huge campaign to go vote for that person. Uh, so this campaigning goes on a lot. Now whether, I mean, that's the democracy, right? I mean, we want to promote what we uh, feel like is right. And so if that's the case, uh, our, our representative that might be representing us in this assembly, basically just going to be uh, uh, kind of leaders who will follow the crowd or what? I, I just kind of... Um, just a thought, I don't have a solution. It, I, you know, it, it's just an interesting thing about humanity with all our uncertainties and differences. I mean, how do we reconcile? That's the question. Terrific, thank you. And that, that would be a great segue. Um, so now on to Gail's question, um, which is as follows. Let me just move it so I can see it, okay. In a world federation, only individuals will be tr only individuals will be tried for crimes. I wonder whether um, wh I wonder whether that would be a bit of a dilemma for truly democratic countries. Why should democratically elected heads of state be prosecuted if they truly represent their citizens? Shouldn't only unrepresentative, like dictatorial heads of state, be prosecuted as individuals? So I'll take a cue on that one. Okay, I see Arthur. Anybody after Arthur? Okay, Donna. Okay, and then I'll put myself in the queue as well. Okay, Arthur, take it away. Well, I think, uh, you know, everybody thinks that they've got the, the superior system and like we think, oh, we're, we're the democracy, but yet we see uh, the incredible kind of voter manipulation and, uh, and, and fraud really that goes on uh, in the US and goes on in many of the countries who consider themselves the ones who are uh, democratic. And we also see how you know, leaders, I mean, Hitler was elected. Uh, uh, you know, leaders can be elected in a supposed democracy that doesn't, shouldn't make them, uh, shouldn't, uh, uh, well, if you eliminate them from being, <laughs> uh, being tried, uh, you're really taking away responsibility of the major war criminals. So. <laughs> Um, I would, I would say, let's think about how to apply law universally. Isn't that the basic principle of law that it applies to all, regardless of of power? I mean, you can't say, well, I headed this gang and I killed that person because the whole gang voted that I should go kill him, so I shouldn't be prosecuted. I was just carrying out the the popular vote. You know. <laughs> Thank you, Arthur. Donna. Yeah, I was going to say something similar. I mean, what we're talking about is arresting individuals who break the world law, the law that everybody's agreed. These will be things like no war, you know, no selling of weapons of mass destruction. I mean, so like it, um, you know, the current model of punishing a country when, when the people at the top do something just hurts innocent people. So I'd say anybody who gets elected in a democratic nation needs to make sure that they're following the law and because it's impossible to uh, to put an entire people in prison makes sense to me and and, and also all the examples right now of how things are happening in our so-called democracy that 
you know, I don't feel it represents my my point of view. So I wouldn't want to go to jail for what is going on now. Thank you, Donna. Um, Bob, okay. what, what, what I have to say really parallels what Donna said, that I, I think there are two different things here. One is that world law is, at least in theory, created by the people. It, it's what the people want at the, at the global level. So if the people want X and then they vote for somebody as their president or prime minister, or whatever, um, who does not X, you know, does the opposite or whatever, breaks the law, um, then they're not following the will of the people, even if they were elected by the people. You know, someone could be elected, but then break the law, you know. So, um, so yes, yeah, so I, I, I think, again, and for all the other reasons that were mentioned, uh, that individual accountability uh, spares no one. Uh, that everybody's, you know, no one is above the law, whether elected or not. And I will say that also brings up another issue that's not one of the questions here. If we have time, I'll raise it, uh, or I guess I'll raise it next time, which is that do all nations in a world federation need to be democracies? And what defines a democracy? So that's been a question that's come up in a number of arenas, and I'll, I'll, I'll bring it up next time in our summary conversation. So, okay, next cue. Anyone else want to jump in on this one? Going once, going twice. Yeah, well, Ron, I'm going to you anyway, but let me get Gail in because Ron, you'll have the last word. Right. Go ahead, Gail. I'll wait. Yeah, I was just going to say that it raises the question of what is a democracy, you know, and so, um, and, and the issue of, well, only democratic countries should be members, you know, that would then mean you'd have to decide what country, what countries are democracies and not. And I think that's a very difficult question, actually, because the U.S. itself, according to a Princeton and Northwest University report, recent report, said that the U.S. is not a democracy it, in that it doesn't reflect the, the, the decision, the poli our policy decisions do not reflect um, what the uh, American public uh, think. And this was uh, over a thousand policy issues. So if the U.S. isn't a democracy, um, you know, it raises the issue for other countries too. For an oligarchy. <laughs> Great. Yeah, Anybody? So U.S. is an oligarchy. Okay, fine. Anybody? Okay, let me get Ron and then see if anybody else wants to jump in because we still have time on this question. Go ahead, Ron. I think a lot of good com comments are being made. I just want to note that we are passing from one kind of conversation to another, from how does law get made to how does law get enforced. That's two different issues. One is the political problem of how to count votes when you're making laws. The other is how do you enforce the law? Do you go after individuals or do you go after groups? And I do believe that one of the things that's come rather become rather clear at the international level with the International Criminal Court is you've got to have an enforcement system that focuses on individuals. It just does not work when you try to enforce law against groups. Thank you, Ron. So we do have time if anybody else wants to get into the queue on this issue. Going once, going twice. Okay. Oh, go ahead, David. Yeah, um, this is a, an issue that's come before uh, me with the students I'm working with this summer, uh, preparing more, um, to prove to the world why we need a World Court of Human Rights. And the question that the students pose to me is, um, in a World Court of Human Rights, uh, it, would it be individual against you know, suing an individual? Would it be individual suing a national government or a corporation? Uh, where does jurisdiction lie? And now hearing this conversation makes me think that not only should an individual be able to uh, take a case against a national government or a corporation, but um, maybe an individual or a group should be able to um, take a case against an individual who has committed a human rights violation. But it's really, it's, yeah, it's all just really interesting to me to determine where the jurisdiction will lie. Just 
that's a simple point. Thank you, David. Anybody else? We do have time on this question. Okay, okay hearing none. Um, so the, the last question submitted was one from Gail, but if, if I can just address Gail directly. Um, Gail, the, the, that question asks about the roadmap, uh, the, the theory of change roadmap, but there are a number of people on this call who are not on the board who don't know what that is, who are not involved in the focus groups and all that stuff. So I would propose that we defer that, that question uh, because not, a number of people won't know what we're talking about. And instead we open the floor now to see if there are any other questions that came up. Are you okay with that? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, great. And I, I do have the same question mm -hmm. myself, but it wouldn't be fair to talk about it with, with people who don't know what we're talking about. Okay, Donna, you have a comment on that? I, one suggestion is to use it as a springboard to talk about the different paths to a world federation. Because to me, that's what it brought up the question of about, you know, what I'm talking about, what is the best mm. path to a world federation. So one possibility would be to take her question and turn it that way, unless people have other questions they want to raise. Okay. Well, and I was just going to open the floor um, now. So if, if, if uh, Gail or you, Donna, want to reframe that question, uh, in that way, that's great, but floor is open. So anybody wanna propose a question or a topic on, you know, related to Ron's chapter seven and eight? Um, okay, yes, um, Bob. I was Bob going Hoover. to ask Ron, in chapter seven of his book, he talks about one way of deciding how many votes a different country would receive would be either according to the number of people in the country or the square root of the ratio of the biggest to the smallest country said, I was wondering where he got the idea of using the square root and whether actuarials use that or insurance brokers or something, how that came up. Right, Ron, direct question. <laughs> well, I do not have any great amount of information about that, but I am aware of studies that have been done with regard to group voting and when it makes a big difference to allow individuals to vote separately. And I am quite aware of the studies that have been done that show that at a certain point, it doesn't make a lot of sense to allow the groups to control things. That um, you, you need to have individuals finally making the decisions, but you do have to take account of mob psychology. You have to be aware of how people have their viewpoint modified by the other viewpoints that they're hearing about. Okay, thank you, Ron. Uh, Carla. Uh, on that point, Ron, uh, I wonder if what your observation for your, would have to do with our electoral college. Well, the, the, the U.S. electoral college is a particular historical development that is understandable only if you realize that it was a move that was made in order to move from the Articles of Confederation to the federal government. The, in the article, under the Articles of Confederation, each colony had one vote. So the argument was, if you're gonna have a national system, and then you're gonna to have to have, and you're gonna have states, should each state have the same vote or not, depending on its population or not depending on its population. And so the compromise was, we'll have a Senate where each state will have two votes, and then we'll have the House of Representatives, which is based on population. And that gives you a bicameral legislature. And then you have to figure out which powers are going to belong to this particular body and which powers are going to belong to that body. And in fact, in our own federal system, this is still a contentious issue all the time. What, what do the states control? And what does the federal government control? But we, you know, 
it's an evolution, uh, it's a growing process. And the United States is one of the best examples of how you have moved from a confederation to a federation of a large population. They did it in Switzerland, but with a much smaller population. One of the biggest issues at the time that the United States was being formed is could you have democracy in a bigger institution? And the founding fathers worked out the best that they could at that time, but things change all the time and we're still growing on how to make our government work better. And that would obviously also have to go on with the global system. In fact, one of the main difficulties with the United Nations is that they made it too difficult to amend it. it and uh, when, when you make it so it's so difficult to make amendments, then you prevent gradual change. Thank you, Ron. So I'm going to do something that we do from time to time, which is acknowledge the fact that there are people on the call who have not spoken at all. So I want to give them the floor. If there's anyone who has not gotten into the conversation at all, or has spoken only once, let's say, is there any, are there any folks in that group that want to say anything about any of the, of the subjects we talked about at this time? Going once. Going twice, yes, take it away, Lee. You got to unmute. You got to unmute yourself. Unmute. Okay. The question I proposed earlier before, the, before this meeting <clears throat> had to do with uh, whether anyone thinks that um, our recent efforts with um, uh, the um, UN 75 or UN 2020, if either of those uh, have been in any way successful in promoting our ideas um, or not. In other words, are we wasting our time or is there something more we could be doing to promote this, these ideas? Thank you, Lee. Anyone want to respond to that? Going once, going twice. Yes, Ron, Ron and then I'll put myself in. I, I think we have to recognize that this is a revolutionary period in human history. Things are changing very, very quickly. Whether the UN 2020 can do very much <laughs> is really up in the air. Uh, partly because things are changing so quickly. Think what a huge difference is going to make what happens in the election in November in this country. Think what, how important it is what's going on in other countries. So it's very difficult to make any kind of decisions. You can only base it on principles and general ideas of how to proceed. Thank you, Ron. And calling on myself, then I'll get Barad in. Um, I, I want to um, re reference two um, progressive um, heroes of mine, one Naomi Klein and the other Chris Hedges, um, in, in response to what Lee just brought up. One Naomi Klein, who uh, was first put on the map with her book, The Shock Doctrine, um, and has written just one landmark book after another. Um, she points out that in times of crisis, that ideas that are laying around are often grabbed and we and run with, um, and and that happened during 9/11. That that this idea of the you know uh, you know of U.S. dominance and all that stuff was laying around in certain ways, and um, and the whole and you know everything that Bush did, um, so that got grabbed and, and went forward. And I and I think we need to have our ideas laying around. In, in very prominent places, so that when things are crumbling and people are looking for something, we're there, and we're there in a big way. Now, it's better if we're more than laying around, but at the very least, we need to be there. So that's my first thing. The second is more in line with what Ron just said, and to quote Chris Hedges, uh, another, he was a war correspondent for the New York Times, 
then went on to work more independently. And uh, he says, I don't do what I do because I think I'll be successful. I do what I do because it's right. And, and I think that really, when I'm in my moments of sorrow, my dark nights of the soul, and whatever, go, oh my God, this is not make, you know, is this making a difference, et cetera, et cetera. I often turn to thoughts like that, that I do what I do because it's right. Um, whether or not it's successful at the moment, you really don't know the kind of ripple, systemic ripple effects that your work has. You know, I have students from decades ago coming to me saying what a difference a particular class made. And I, I had no idea at the time. So anyway, so those are my, that's what um, that comment triggered for me. Thank you. I saw a couple of hands. If I could see them again, I wasn't writing while I was talking. I saw Donna. Okay, Donna and anybody else? Was there a second? Okay, Bharat and Arthur. Okay, so uh, take it away, Donna. Oh, Barat was ahead of me, and you missed oh, David Gallup, right. but Barat oh, was up first. It's okay. And get Thank, David you. Uh, Thank you for you keeping Go track. ahead, Donna. Uh, no, Barat, take it. You were in line. I just didn't okay. write it down. All right. Well, you know, listening to the uh, conversations here, uh, there's a lot of quandary in my mind as to, you know, what is possible and you know, what will be the path forward. So a thought is incubating in currently, I'm not very clear. So please uh, uh, just, uh, let me just say it. Uh, perhaps somebody else could clarify it. The thought is, is that as a trained physicist, whenever we have a kind of a proposition and we are not sure of how something might work, we try to do an experiment. And so I'd like to propose an experiment here with the technologies that we have now, uh, you know, internet and so on. Why don't we create a game called World Federation? And in that World Federation, we try to evolve the rules uh, by initially proposing the rules and having community uh, participate in it and come up with how they see those rules. I have no idea where this will go, but it could be done as an interesting experiment and we'll have large enough sample that could be representative of a mini world, so to speak. And if we can succeed in that enterprise, uh, you know, it, it'll have to be a project. Maybe we have to do some fundraising and get some IT guys in, in our game and put our thoughts to it. it. It could be sort of a small CGS Manhattan project or something. Anyway, that's, that's the thought. I would love to see if people have comments or anything on it. Okay. Well, thank you, Bharat. In keeping with letting people in who have not spoken or have spoken very little, um, I want to recognize David Gallup, and I also have Donna and Arthur in the queue. Um, oh, and I see uh, Tom Camarella as well. Okay, so uh, David. Yes, okay. I actually have two quick points. One, Bob, I think one of the best things that you've done for uh, World Federation CGS is creating that roadmap for change. I think that's amazing. And I think uh, part of what Ron's book was about was to say that we can see that there could be, or should there be, a World Federation. And that roadmap shows us how we can get there. My um, feeling is that we need additional roadmaps. So, and Bob, you've mentioned this already, but we shouldn't just have a roadmap that maybe takes us through the UN system. I think we should have other options like Ron's book talks about near the end of the book, uh, other options of how we can get to World Federation. So I'd love, now I'm not asking for an assignment here for me to do it, because <laughs> I'm worried that's what's gonna, yeah, exactly, <laughs> what's gonna happen next. But I think we need more roadmaps. And the second point um, is back in the 1990s, so it was really sort of at the beginning stages of the internet, World Service Authority had created a World's Integrity Project, which is sort of what Bharat was talking about, also what Arthur's talked about a little bit, which is to, use the icosahedron 30, 30 strutted shape uh, um, that was uh, sort of um, used by, uh, what's his name? Um, 
I can't remember the, the, the scientist. Was that Buckminster Fuller? Buckminster, Buckminster oh. Fuller, thank you. And to get people into that non-hierarchical shape so that they could actually come together and ask the central question, how can we as sovereign world citizens govern our world? And we had 30 different groups in 30 different cities. So this was an actual project that was not well funded and it sort of ended by the end of the 1990s because we didn't have enough funding, but it would be easy to do this non-hierarchical question in that strutted oh. tape so people could come together and, and answer the, that question, you know, whether it's about the environment or women's rights or inequality or poverty, each of those struts in that shape, uh, people could talk about. And then what happened is each uh, group's um, decisions that came out of those meetings, it was a three-day meeting, sort of played like a game, actually. Those decisions would then get sent to the next group of people. You know, one was in Kombolcha, Ethiopia. One was in Australia. One was in Burlington, Vermont. And so people from one part of the world could see what other people in other parts of the world had said about how we can govern our world. And it was really an amazing process, which I wish we had more funding to, to continue. Thank you, David. Staying with the theme of letting people in who haven't spoken that much or not at all, uh, Tom Camarella. Tom, you're on mute. Sorry about that. I'm constantly amazed at how the kids gravitate towards any kind of a game at all. And number two, uh, there's now games of how you can build your own village or your own nation. Uh, and that uh, I see it working. The kids like it. So if there is some way that we, uh, somebody we know who can meld the two, that would be absolutely fabulous because uh, people that start playing them, a lot of them are young and are idealistic. And that's what we need, people who can uh, open their minds yet. So uh, I love the idea, Bharat. Thank you. <laughs> Terrific. Thank you. Just pointing out, we have a little more than 10 minutes to go. I'm going to begin to bring this to a close in about five minutes so we can do the wrap-up announcements and things of that sort. So anybody else who wants to get in the queue who has not spoken at all, or very little, and if not, I'll turn to Donna and Arthur. Seeing none, take it away, Donna. I love Barat's idea. He's, he's also the one who got us to start our Esperanto class. So Barat, I love your ideas, they're great. Um, Bob and I had an amazing, inspiring, exciting meeting with about 12 active advocates for World Federation who are under 40. And their enthusiasm and commitment and energy was was toxic, was not toxic, the, was enthusiasm, was uh, what's the opposite of toxic, was so exciting. And they might just be the right group of people to, to help us create a game for World Federation. They do a lot on a shoestring. They have very little money. And um, anyway, I... I, um, they, the other thing that they said, I, I actually was trying to answer Lee's question about um, is this worthwhile. Um, they said that there's you know, a lot of young people these days who consider their community to be the world community, that the, like the young people growing up see themselves as part of the world community. And, and uh, they even have a group they call the Global Tribe, one, of, one group of these people. So... I am, I don't think we're wasting our time at all. I'm really excited about connecting with the next generation. I think that's an important thing we have to do. And I also just want to say, whenever I talk about the UNPA, I just definitely am talking about the people of the world electing representatives to a UN parliamentary assembly. I am not talking about the NGOs having, having a voice that, that isn't elected by the people of the world. I just wanted to be clear about that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Donna. I'm going to get Arthur and Barat, and then most likely I'm going to come in to begin to close. Go ahead, Arthur. Got to get off mute. Bottom of the page. Bottom of the page. We don't hear you, Arthur. We don't hear you. There we go. Okay, sorry about Arthur. that. Uh, excuse me. I uh, uh, I was going to just show show you a second. First of all, I also like uh, Barat's idea, and uh, I have a uh, uh, I have a proposal. Oh, 
can't do that. All right. Um, I was going to, uh, <laughs> uh, we have actually a proposal for just such a game, and I was going to share my screen a second if you want to see it, or we can talk about it later. Go to earthoperatingsystem.com, and you will see a, a proposal for a game where kids interactively develop uh, and work with, and we all work with, developing a new operating system for our planet, earthoperatingsystem.com. Uh, but also, I was going to say, so I think the game idea is great, and we should should develop that. I also like Bob's idea that we should develop a, uh, a kind of a demonstration project, and Sushiant, who won, was one of the winners of the Global Challenge Foundation proposal for such a bottom-up democracy, uh, has uh, is going to be one of the coming up speakers at our Earth, at the World is My Country Club, and David's coming up next week with a more discussion where you can hear more about what he talked about, about integrity and synergy and how we begin to develop this. So that's also a great place to do what Bharat said to begin to. We have, we're bringing in a number of great speakers to talk about these different things. How can we create a new economy? How can we create new key parts of the people powered planet? Uh, so do take a look at, uh, maybe we can send an email out later uh, announcing the, uh, uh, the world is my country club uh, that you can, can come into uh, where we discuss that. And upcoming is the police chief of Santa Fe who went to Bosnia and Serbia and brought together warring police into one unit. And he also talks about the absurdity of, of compromise and the old ideas of consensus, just like uh, Tom talked about, uh, but how there can be new, more advanced collaborative uh, systems where we don't have <laughs> consensus or just, uh, but we have a, a really what, what, what David's talking about, this, this, this sort of more synergistic uh, new model. Uh, so lots more that we can all talk about. We're having a lot of a great discussion today. Thanks to everybody. Thank you, Arthur. And Bharat. Well, I just want to say I'm very happy to see that there is a resonance to this idea. And since I opened up, I want to make sure that please count me in if we develop a, a, I, I don't know if I can lead a group in getting it together but I certainly will participate. And I also feel I may be able to contribute through my connections in India to some high powered IT teams without sure. much cost, you know. And sure. uh, but we have to develop some kind of a, uh, uh, you know, action plan and, and a serious commitment of sorts. And that could be a CGS project for the world. Anyway, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Bharat. I see Father Ben's hand up. If you take yourself off mute, we will hear you. Gail also put up her hand. Uh, I just want to say, uh, when we're discussing where to go with the economy, how to build the, an economy, I suggest uh, a little book that I have in my hand here. It's called Principles of a Pluralist Commonwealth by Dr. Gar Alperovitz. He, he very clearly describes changes that we can make in what we're now doing. Better changes, I think. Thank you, Father Ben. Okay, I have time for one, maybe two more comments, and then I'll begin to wrap it up. Tom. Uh, th there's a wonderful economist uh, who, uh, you see on Democracy Now! and shows like that. Uh, his name is Richard Wolff, W-O-L-F-F. -F, and uh, he's, he's a pretty good, good guy. Try him. Thank you, Tom. Any other comments? Okay, Gail. You're still on mute. Gail, you're on mute. Yeah, she's working on it. Uh, I was wondering, I thought I saw Brenda's hand up earlier. I wonder oh, if she still had a I'm question. I'm sorry, did I? Nada. Okay. Thank you for checking, Gail. Any other final comments from anyone? Okay, Carla. I just want to clue everybody in that when you're on mute, the simplest way to get off is press your space bar. And on. <laughs> Thank you, Carla. Um, yeah, we've discovered on some computers, unfortunately, that hasn't worked. 
So if you do it and it doesn't work, you've still got to find the unmute button. But yes, that is a great way to, to try. Anyone else? Okay, I, I will just make one comment also kind of triggered by Barat's stimulating comments is one is I believe, I mean, some, some people just mention some simulations of different world possibilities that have been done over the years. And, and I'm remembering there, there, were, there have been a few. I think there was a group called the World Futures Project um, that's coming to mind. And they did some simulations about different possible world futures. So certainly, um, you know, we, we at CGS are looking right now at, at what grants we might apply to. Uh, we're in the midst of or at the early stages of redesigning our website. So we want to get that done first. So when foundations come to look at us, we have the right stories that we want to tell. So we are prioritizing getting the, the website redesigned. But after that, we want to reach out to new, new foundations we haven't before. And certainly with game design and sponsoring simulations, those two areas are things that have not really been in our discussions and on our radar screens, uh, but do seem like fabulous opportunities. So I will not forget that. And I will not forget, Bharat, that you volunteered to be at least part of a team and maybe even head one. So uh, you'll, hear, you'll hear from me or my, my lawyers, as they say. <laughs> so um, so that's, uh, that, that's that comment. So, so speaking of which, that's the perfect segue to say that, um, as I've said before, um, that CGS does more than just run on air. Uh, we also run on money. Um, we, we are right now, you know, we, we just incurred a $1,700 fee to get all the back end stuff, all the uh, data management and all that behind the website, all the, the databases and stuff all working. Um, so we, we paid $1,700 to consult to find the right package. Now we're going to enter into a new contract or we are entering into it to run that package. And then the estimates we have for a redesign go from 11,000 to $54,000 uh, among the companies that we've reached out to. Uh, obviously at one end you, you know, I mean, there's different quality, you know, one person versus teams working on it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but want to let you know that these things don't happen without money. Um, our, um, we want to change the world. Uh, one does not do that by breaking open their piggy bank and just relying on that. So I want to encourage everybody, if you are not already a member or a donor, uh, to please go to our website and become one. Um, if you are already, um, we welcome any contributions beyond that, as well as volunteer time and other ways that folks can give input. And if what you do is show up here, that's fabulous as well. So I want to thank everybody. Again, um, reiterate before I hand it over to Gail, um, that our meeting is, um, can you say the date, uh, Gail, the next meeting? Yes, it's Saturday, August 15. It's the second Saturday of the month. That's the usual pattern. And at the same time, which is 12 to 1.30 Eastern time, I'm putting it in Eastern time because that's where our, um, where our um, office is. Donna? Okay, so, yeah, so I see The second Saturday hands. is August 8th. The second Saturday is August 8th. Oh my goodness. Oh my. Okay. August uh, 8th? No, it can't be. Yeah, it is. Yes. It is. It is. The fir August yeah. first August 1st is Saturday. Yeah. Oh. Okay, sorry. August okay. 8th. Gail, thank you for that test. That was just to make sure they're paying attention. Uh, <laughs> so, so yes, it is August 8th. Uh, we'll wow. be on next meeting. Thank yeah, you. It, it, Okay, Gail, I'm handing it back to you if there's anything else you want to say by way of goodbye. Well, I suggest that you get your My Country is the World book. Um, David Gallup said that he could get you a copy if you need a copy, or they're available readily on Amazon. So um, I suggest you uh, order it now, and then uh, you'll be in plenty of time for our next book. Okay, thank you, everybody. Thank you. I, I think the magic Bye, words are meeting adjourned.
Bye. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Good to see you. Bye. 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 Yeah, well, Bye. Thank, thank you all. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, and we'll thank you, Ron. <laughs> yeah, yes, thank, thank you, Ron. Ron. <laughs> Great book, Ron. Great book. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Thanks to all of you. Uh -huh.